Hey, Warners, welcome to another episode of The Women Your Mother Warned You About, brought to you by Sales Gravy. And if you have not checked out Sales Gravy, you need to go do that to level up to the next place in sales. You can check out almost 300 courses, both live and on demand. Several of those courses I have created. So thank you to our sponsor, Sales Gravy and Sales Gravy University for giving us this platform. Today on this episode, it is a solo episode. I don't do a lot of those. And every now and then, here we are. I've got, it's going to be a little bit of a funny story, maybe unusual, but I love drawing the parallels between life experiences and things that happen. And how do we take those stories and relate them in business and sales as learning stories? So today, bear with me because I want to get all of this right. I am here to talk about my swan. Okay, that is the story I'm talking about today. This is going to seem like a strange topic. And I recently told my publisher about this feral swan in my pond. And she quite honestly encouraged me to write about it and to find find some kind of learning or patterns from it. And she's also a big believer in swans entering your life for a certain reason. And and, and I've got a lot of lines, a parallel lines to draw here. Let's talk a little bit about this. And uh, the publisher, and I got into this because she is currently publishing a compilation book called Ignite Connections, which is these stories about people and and their relationships to animals. And I was actually joking with her. I was like, I don't know if I would contribute to that compilation because I don't know if I really have a good story there. And they started talking about this one. And that's where she's like, no, that that is a good story. With that publisher, I have published a book called Ignite Your Courage, which has gone to number one, which is pretty cool. And now she's helping me publish Improvised Intelligence coming out in 2024. So let's talk a little bit about the swan. Sammy the swan. Okay. I have formed a bond with a swan, which, yes, I have given him a name and this might sound crazy to some, but what some might call crazy, I call curious because I'm just naturally curious about behavior, about human behavior. I'm always studying human behavior, typically not wild animals until now. And this is where I think there's so much to be learned. The timing is serendipitous because as I'm writing this book on how to use improv to increase emotional intelligence. A big piece of that is how do we get better at social awareness? And a lot of that has to do with observation and observing. And in this situation, the swan has become like a training opportunity for me to improve my ability to observe and anticipate behavior. So I don't think we spend enough time observing human behavior. And I think it affects us, in my opinion. We don't watch people with intense curiosity to understand them, probably because we're too busy trying to fulfill our own agenda. We got too much to do. Like I don't want to focus on studying people. We try to listen to them, but we're not really watching or observing like with our eyes and our intuition, not just our ears. And we all have a hard time keeping up with this. But the idea of studying for some people just might not be a priority. And I think it should be a requirement if you want to be successful at cultivating and leveraging relationships. So let's talk about the swan and how this relates and and what I've learned. So first, a little bit of backstory on this story about Sammy. One day, he and his mate, which I named Sophie, by the way, showed up in our backyard pond. So like a kid, I was so enthralled with this. These animals are beautiful and majestic and way bigger than I ever thought because I never really was around swans. And now I was. If they were humans, they would be known for what I call the it factor right? It's that thing, that magnetic thing. Like they just show up so majestically and you just stare at them because you're just in awe of them. So they've got that it factor. Uh, Eventually, these two swans found their way to our patio. I'm assuming they were looking for food. Uh, The slightly larger one was a hisser. He was hissing. And the other one was always typically quiet and just followed behind the hisser. Now, I may have been profiling but I assume that the hissing one 
was the male because he was showing his aggression to protect himself and his partner. Then one day I had to leave town on business and I was gone for about two weeks. And when I came back, there was only one swan. And I'm like, I asked my husband, what happened to the swan? Of course, he he has no idea. He's got got no idea or no interest in this. He thinks I'm a little kooky about it. Uh, But our community has a Facebook page and and on the Facebook page, that's where I found out that the other swan died tragically. They by most likely an alligator, possibly another predator. Alligators are kind of like a number one predator of swans. Why do I know that? Because Google. So this this kind of this broke my heart. I was like, I knew something was wrong. What happened? But there are rumors, nothing's happened yet or transpired, but there are rumors that the wildlife authority has been trying to find a mate for this swan. I really, I got so invested in Sammy emotionally uh, as he's a widower. I know again, it sounds crazy, but swans mate for life. Didn't know that, right? So they mate for life. Now he is like without his mate. And I started researching and studying swans and learned, like I said, that they mate for life just like humans. And because of that, I started developing these emotions with this feral animal. And I started wondering what would happen to him without Sophie. Uh, Again, childlike curiosity that I've always had. So there are two types of people in my community, uh, and they actually say it outwardly on Facebook. There are those in my community who are afraid of him and shoo him away. Like they even said like, oh, he hisses and I'm scared, right? And then there are those who really feel sorry for him and try to give him attention because we're all looking out for him. Well, not all, but a lot of us. So let's start there with the human behaviors of fear and compassion. We fear what we don't know or what appears to be scary. If Sammy was a human, he might be perceived as aggressive, angry, potentially dangerous. Like I never thought that of swans until I encountered this one. I've even had friends say to me to be careful, he might attack me. And their fear can certainly be valid, but they've also never encountered him. And they're so they're kind of just making assumptions on maybe what they heard or maybe what they have experienced. I don't know. Meanwhile, back in the human world, the same could be true if you think about humans with those characteristics, right? There are people to be careful around, people who are perceived as aggressive, angry, potentially dangerous to our well-being. In my heart, I don't think I don't think they mean to be that way. This is usually like their behavior is usually an emotional disposition based on things that have happened to them. They're acting out as a form of protection or self-defense. They don't want to let people too near them, too close to them because their own fears and maybe past negative experiences. So I can certainly be careful of a feral animal, and I am. I think he and I do this dance. I'm afraid of him. He's afraid of me, but with each other. And I can still have compassion with boundaries, to make sure I'm not harmed, which I can also do with humans if I choose to and if I remember to, right? Because we always put a spotlight on ourselves too often and forget about thinking of others. The reason why I can give this type of grace to a wild animal or emotional human is because of the time that I spend observing and attempting to understand the behavior I'm witnessing or receiving. Aside from my curiosity, I'm also in the mindset of what if or what is the real story here, which helps me dig into my empathy. So when I'm dealing with people with different types of emotions, I always go to like what happened to that person to behave that way Um, or when I react, right? When I have a visceral reaction to something, I I dial into my self-empathy like why am I reacting this way, right? And we can do this. There are exercises that you can do for checking in with your own self-empathy. So for example, an exercise that I often do with clients is, all right, let's jot down this inventory. Someone does something that affects you. You have a reaction to it. So write down that, that thing, right? Like maybe Joe is always late. And then what does that make you feel? Like, what is the emotion that comes up for you, right? Instantly, that emotion is like, oh, 
I'm so mad. And then what is the thought, right? If you start to get rid of the emotion and then process the thought, what is the thought, right? Joe's late, which then impacts my meeting, which then potentially makes me look bad, What, whatever you, you come up with that. And then you kind of determine like, what are your needs as a result of those things? So the point is, is that we can tap in to self-empathy, right? So that we can become more empathetic of others. And empathy is nothing without compassion. So we can have empathy and be empathetic, but then we have to take action. That's where the compassion comes in. So other observations I've had, other things that I've learned from studying this one is communication is like the big one. It's like the biggest piece of this. I'm doing this communication dance with this feral animal. Uh, Communication is, or lack of, is the number one complaint I hear from most organizations or from employees or from leadership. Like they don't communicate or we don't get the messages or we're always the last to know, or maybe they don't like the style of communication or it's perceived incorrectly or it's conveyed incorrectly, right? This is a constant issue, epidemic that we see all the time. So Back to the swan, Sammy and I, we are foreigners to each other, meaning we have our own languages. We don't speak the same language. So we have to study each other to figure out what we're trying to say to each other. We're trying to find the meaning in our actions and our behavior in all of the nonverbal, right? This takes time and patience, especially on my part. I can't speak for him, but I have to have some level of patience to really like taking the time to study him, which I do daily right now. Now, even at this very moment, it's like the afternoon and he is not in the pond. And I'm like, where is he? I like have now developed this bond with him and a care for him that I'm like, where I, I hope he's off flying to another pond, which he sometimes does to find a mate because he can go find his own mate, right? Wildlife should not have to remate him. So maybe that's what he's doing, but I have this connection. Over time, uh, he's, he's come to know my voice. He's come to know my voice. I've come to know his voice. Now, I would like to believe that he truly knows his name because I have named him like literally the whole community is referring to him by name. But when I do call out his name, especially when he's like on the other side of the pond, he literally he his his whole body reacts to it. Like, what was that? And then he sees me and he beelines like if he's on the other side of the pond, he beelines like they they paddle fast. He paddles quickly to my side of the pond, gets out of the water, waddles up and just shows up on my patio. Or sometimes I don't see him and I'll go out there and call his name. And then he just appears. I don't know where he was. He just shows up. So he also has a couple different ways of talking to to me to convey what he needs and he feels. So when I call him, he makes interesting head gestures, raising his neck up and down in a swooping manner while making kind of this chirping noise. Like he has, he's like three kinds of different noises that he shares with me. If I'm not outside, He'll show up. He will show up. Sometimes I have my, my, my porch door open. He will show up. I might be early in the morning working and he will make a very distinct noise to get my attention, basically saying, hey, I'm here. Come outside. It's, it's a different noise of all the noises he makes. So it's this like short snorting sound. And then he expands his wings. So his wings actually make a noise. And so I can hear that. And then I come out when I hear that in response to that. According to research, <laughs> it's crazy. That snorting noise is a way, it's like the way to greet a mate or another swan friend, I guess. So that noise is like specifically connected to that. So the running joke is I'm his temporary mate right now. Luckily, my husband is not too jealous about this. And then there's the hissing, right? He makes this hissing noise. And while he, and, and sometimes when he hisses, he stands up real tall and expands his wings. And it's basically like he's taking up all this space with his wings. So it's his way of saying, hey, don't come near me, right? He expands his space, hisses, he's telling me, don't come near me, don't hurt me. So he's understandably cautious as I am, right? Because I technically stand taller than him. He's trying to make himself bigger. He did not hiss at me at all today. So maybe that's the evolution of our relationship. I'm intentional in observing his communication style as if he were speaking a foreign language, right? So what if we did that every day, in our everyday lives with people. What if 
you were intentional with like, I don't understand this person. So I'm going to under, I'm going to really pay attention to try to understand. I think sometimes that we take verbal communication for granted, like the actual words, we understand the words and we sometimes tune them out at the same time. So our brains are used to a pattern of conversation, a pattern of speech, and maybe we're not fully listening. But when we don't fully understand someone's language or even an accent, someone with an accent different from ours that we're not used to, we tend to focus more intensely. Like we stop and pay attention. It's like, am I hearing this right? Especially on body language to ensure that we're understanding others. For the most part, body language is pretty universal. So we could all speak a different verbal language, but body language for the most part doesn't change, except in some cultural situations, right? There's some cultural differences. There's some great books on that. 92% of our communication is nonverbal. So paying attention to a voice and face and like the tone of the voice or how we move our body, that's 92% of our communication. So we really can understand people that don't speak our language by watching their behavior. So we could look for those cues. There's some other patterns uh, of behavior with Sammy and I. We both seem to do things that affect or impact each other by establishing routines and then like watching each other's routines and almost testing each other's routines. So for example, every morning at sunrise, he typically waits on my side of the pond, on our side of the pond, directly in front of our back, our, our patio, right? He is right there. He's like waiting for me to come out. And when he hears the door, I don't even have to speak anymore. In the beginning I did, I don't anymore. I open the door. He hears the door. And I think sometimes he even sees the kitchen light go on and I go, I open the door, I go make coffee. And as soon as I come back with the coffee, he's already on the patio. He's already waddled up. If I've slept in, right, and he's waiting in the pond and he doesn't see me, he will just make his way to the patio and wait. He will wait on the patio for me to come out. And then he greets me with that snorting noise. He comes to me anytime he sees me outside. Right. He just automatically comes sometimes like I'll be sitting on the screened in porch and not sitting on the patio, like maybe when it's raining or I'm just not ready to go outside. He will actually come up on the patio, go to the door. And now he's starting to beak, put his beak on the door as a way of knocking or saying like, hey, are you coming out? You always come out like now I'm intrigued by it. So I ha- I kind of sit out there just to see what he's going to do. And now he's kind of seeing what I'm going to do and taking the next step to engage me right now by knocking on the door. So this is a little bit of an experiment for improving my social management. Right. So there's social awareness, paying attention right in EQ. And then there is what are we going to do with that? And how are we going to manage that process? Since he leaves special gifts for me in the grass that I am responsible for cleaning up, says my husband, uh, I often come out to hose, hose down his mess. I try to do this when he's not around. At least I did in the beginning because I didn't want to scare him with the streaming water. Uh, I made this assumption that it would scare him when I use the hose because I actually use the hose to scare away the geese because actually the geese are annoying swan not so much but the geese i just i don't jive with the geese maybe it's a personality thing but i've used the hose to like spray at them and they run away um they hate being sprayed with water so i assumed that the swan would hate the water and so i don't want to scare him so i i avoid it but one day while i was doing i was out there um he just kept walking up to me and i'm like all right i'm not i got things to do i'm gonna just keep spraying And he got under the stream of water to catch the water in his beak. And it was like the funniest thing watching his beak literally chomp at the water stream. I I, I literally could not stop laughing at this. I have video of it because it's so funny. He also likes to drink the water as it forms puddles in the grass right? So he's actually seeking that water, which makes sense because it's got to taste better than the pond water. And so I watched that. So we've actually created this new playful routine where he just, he like plays like a kid in a sprinkler. Like he's waddling through the water 
he doesn't mind the water like touching him and spraying him down. So now I actually spray him down like I clean him off coming out of the pond. And then when he's done, he's had enough. He walks away. The most important learning piece of this for me was that we cannot make assumptions about behavior. Like we make these assumptions about behavior. A swan is not a goose, right? The swan is not behaving like the goose necessarily, but I'm assuming because they're both waterfalls, fowls, I'm making an assumption that they're going to behave the same, but they have different likes and dislikes and they react differently. And I learned this just through the simple observation. And again, we don't always do this. We just make an assumption that this person is going to act like that person because they have the same job title or they come from the same place or they come from the same industry, right? We just sort of profile that and that is just not the case, right? So in summary, here are things that I've learned that you could also apply in improving your own emotional intelligence. So intentional behavior observation and attempting to understand someone's language, right? So be intentional with observing the behavior and attempting to understand their language. This is going to increase your emotional intelligence and it's going to strengthen relationships, even some of the volatile ones, or we can call them feral. Sometimes people are experiencing something challenging that affects their behavior. And this is an opportunity to be empathetic, patient, and compassionate. Uh, You can't assume that all birds flock together, meaning don't assume that all people behave the same way for the same reasons. Take the time to understand someone's routine or desired way of doing things, as well as exhibit your own preferences so they know what you like and how you do things. So it's really a game of give or take. And then overall, observation and attempting to understand others is work and a discipline, but the reward is in the relationship. So a little bit of a different kind of episode today, but to me, it was a really great learning that I, why I'm doing this is to practice my observation skills. And uh, I hope you can take something from this and apply it in sales or leadership. Find your own swan. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Women Your Mother Warned You About, brought to you by Sales Gravy. And again, go check out salesgravy.university. We don't have any courses on swans, but maybe I will create a course on observation. Go check that out. And uh, check out womenyourmotherwarnedyouabout.com or salesgravy.com. And we will see you on the next episode. Bye.